This is the story of Dr. Karen Wetterhahn. She was an internationally respected chemistry professor at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. She performed research on the effects of heavy metals on living systems, especially their role in causing cancer. She was also the victim of heavy metal poisoning, specifically dimethylmercury poisoning. Her story is one of the most powerful and sobering examples of why lab safety is not optional. Now, she was a research advisor with people working under her. She didn't ever need to handle chemicals directly herself. In fact, most research advisors don't handle day-to-day -day work directly themselves. But on August 14th, 1996, she was handling dimethylmercury. Why? Because she knew how toxic it was and didn't want anyone else to have to handle it. She had a reputation for being meticulous about safety. And on that day, she was being meticulously safe and following all of the recommended safety precautions for handling dimethylmercury. Now, mercury is a neurotoxin meaning a toxin that affects the nervous system, including the brain. Think of the English idiom, mad as a hatter. The phrase originated because a lot of hat makers in 18th and 19th century England had mercury poisoning. This is because mercury compounds were used to make felt, and then the felt was used to make hats. Dimethylmercury is a lot more toxic than other mercury compounds. One reason is that it has a high vapor pressure, meaning it vaporizes easily and can be inhaled. It also has two methyl groups, and the methyl groups make the molecule nonpolar and therefore much more fat soluble than just regular mercury. So it can pass straight through the skin, cross the blood brain barrier, and get into the brain. Now, the human brain is about 60% fat and dimethylmercury is fat soluble. So a lot of it ends up in the brain. Dr. Wetterhahn later recalled that on that day that she was handling the dimethylmercury, just a couple of drops spilled from the end of the pipette and onto her glove. She didn't panic. The drops just touched her glove, which should protect her skin. She was using a fume hood, so she shouldn't have to worry about the high vapor pressure or inhaling the vapor. She was doing everything that she was supposed to be doing to stay safe. She didn't think she was in any immediate danger, so she cleaned up the area before removing her gloves. What Dr. Wetterhahn didn't know at the time was that dimethylmercury also goes right through latex gloves. So those drops that hit her glove and the time she took to clean up the spill properly were a huge problem. Dimethylmercury can actually permeate a lot of plastic and rubber compounds. So later tests showed that it can actually permeate latex gloves and enter the skin in about 15 seconds. And if the gloves aren't an effective barrier, that means that this extremely toxic form of mercury actually touched her skin, passed straight through her skin and into her bloodstream. And from there, it could go through the blood brain barrier and find its way into the brain without her even knowing. There was no pain, no burning, no sign that anything was wrong. About three months later, she started having brief episodes of abdominal pain and noticed significant weight loss. Five months after the initial incident, she started having the more distinct neurological symptoms of mercury poisoning, like loss of balance and slurred speech. Around this time is when she sought medical attention. At this point, tests showed that she had severe mercury poisoning. Her blood mercury content was about 4,000 micrograms per liter with a toxicity threshold of only 200 micrograms per liter. Her urinary mercury content was 234 micrograms per liter with a toxicity threshold of only 50 micrograms per liter. 
and normal ranges for those are both much, much lower and preferably zero. But the problem with these tests is that blood and urine are both water-based and dimethylmercury is highly fat soluble. So it had to have been in much higher concentrations in bodily organs that were fatty like the brain. She had aggressive chelation therapy, which is when you use a large molecule called a chelating agent that binds to the mercury and leaves the body through, in this case, urine. The treatment was reducing the amount of mercury in her body because more mercury started passing out through her urine, but her condition deteriorated rapidly. Why? At this point in time, a lot of the dimethylmercury had time to make its way into the fatty parts of her body. The chelating agent was predominantly removing mercury from the water-soluble tissues like the blood and urine. It was too late. She was still getting worse. About three weeks after the first neurological symptoms appeared, she was in a vegetative state punctuated by periods of extreme agitation. She died on June 8, 1997, about 10 months after her initial exposure. Her exposure timeline was confirmed by analysis of her hair, which showed a huge jump in mercury levels 17 days after the lab incident, with a peak at 39 days, followed by a gradual decline. So this wasn't long-term accumulated exposure over the course of her career. It was one specific incident. Her story showed that standard safety precautions, which she was following, were completely inadequate for super toxic chemicals like dimethylmercury. Her story shook the scientific world. It rewrote lab protocols. It led to research about glove compatibility and the creation of glove compatibility charts, stricter fume hood guidelines, and a giant rethinking of how we handle toxic substances. OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration in the United States noticed. They now recommend the use of dimethylmercury be completely avoided unless absolutely necessary. And they've mandated the use of these plastic laminate gloves called Silver Shield when handling the compound. Dr. Wetterhahn wanted her story to be shared. Her legacy includes significant and lasting improvements to lab safety. If you ever spend time in a lab, I'm not trying to scare you. This isn't about instilling fear of all chemicals. Statistically, being in a chemistry lab is safer than driving a car or being on a sports field, but it is your job to keep it that way. Every lab safety rule has a reason. Every one of them was written based on someone's experience. Some of them even have someone's life behind them. Please take the lab safety rules that you are supposed to be following seriously. Thanks for watching Chemistry in a Nutshell.